which apropos, this was a good example of where having a good failover strategy makes sense. You know, an active active crew sped this up instead of an active standby model, but we're already getting ahead on that. So it was mentioned, as, as Vic says, this talk is going to be a bit about a journey. And the first thing I always say on a journey to active active is, do you really need it? Because it definitely does solve a lot of problems, and we'll talk, see that today. But it's very hard. It's very hard to manage. So the focus, though, today is really about replication in general and just talking about how Postgres replication has evolved through the years to match what people are doing with Postgres, how they're deploying it, and their expectations when they are replicating data, creating distributed Postgres systems. With today, I mean, primarily we're going to focus on availability, but we'll talk about different use cases around that and what is occurring upstream in Postgres to better support these different replication models. So that all said, you know, I'm, I'm going to just rush a little bit just to be cognizant of time. But the first thing is like a key question, like what is replication? What is replication? Basically just copying data between systems, which sounds very simple, right? I mean, you know, I know one of the first things I learned when I started working with computers was using you know, SCP and RSync. But databases, particularly a database like Postgres that is ACID compliant, there's a lot you need to consider when you're copying data so that you're actually copying the data safely, safely being that your changes will be properly stored on the system. And Postgres itself offers two different kinds of replication. There's physical replication, which is effectively a byte-by-byte -byte copying of your data from one system to another. And there's logical replication, which is where you copy your data, but in a format that could be understood by other systems. And this is a clear distinction, because physical replication is very powerful, very useful, and we're going to see a bunch of reasons why. But it's very specific to that system, whereas logical replication gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of how you copy your data. I mean, you can copy data from Postgres to another system that's not even Postgres in real time with logical replication. So to illustrate this, let's look at physical replication real briefly. So, you know, uh, so Postgres byte chunk of data. And again, this is a little bit of oversimplification for how Postgres physical replication works, but it's a bunch of bytes. And if I want to copy it from a primary to a standby, a primary being my read-write instance, a standby being a read-only instance, I just take all those, I take all those bytes and I just you know, copy them over. Very simple, very efficient. There's a lot that goes on un un you know, underneath the covers for that. But it's a little bit limiting because it truly is a byte-for-byte -byte copying. So there's other things in your system that you need to keep stable. So anything that can affect the output of that file on the other system can affect the replication. It could be your operating system. It could be different major versions of Postgres. You know, it could be the file system. So while it's very powerful and it could be used for a lot of things, there are these limitations. Meanwhile, with logical replication, but logical replication has a little bit of a different model. You have to think about something as a publisher, which is where I'm originating the changes, and then something called a subscriber, which is reading in the changes. And on the publisher, the way we start in Postgres is that we have our byte-for-byte -byte changes for you know, whatever we did, and it gets passed first to something called a decoder. So the decoder reads in the changes from the, the write-ahead log stream, and effectively it does exactly that. It takes them and maps them to a format that could be understood. Now, Postgres has something known as a pluggable decoding infrastructure. It has a built-in one called PG output, which is used for logical replication, but you can build others, and you can use them for all sorts of different purposes, for, for example, for downstream systems. So a popular one is wall to json which is used to read changes out of Postgres in a JSON format, and then you can do whatever you know, mutations on it. So once you decode it, then you need to send it. So the next step is taking those changes, packaging them up, and putting them over the wire. So now we've, you know, we've crossed the wire, we've gone into the subscriber space, and it has a receiver. And the receiver basically reads in the changes. And then finally, those changes need to be applied on the system, and that's the final step. And probably the most important part in logical replication in many ways, because that's taking the changes from the, the source system or the publisher and making sure they get saved in that, you know, in that byte format or that, you know, that native format on the subscriber. Again, that native format could be completely different than what's on the publisher, but that's fine. That's the, that's the benefit of logical replication. So what can you use replication for in Postgres? 
a lot of things. You know, that, that's kind of the point of this slide, and you know, I apologize for the formatting due to you know, some of these last minute changes, but the principal case that really drove the support of replication natively in Postgres was high availability. Being able to keep your system up and available throughout planned, you know, planned downtime events, unplanned downtime events, but there's so much more. Uh, change data capture is something actually I personally used when logical replication first came out for Postgres as a way to be able to stream changes out of my database, and in my case, I was mutating them in real time into a table that basically was an incrementally refreshed materialized view. I had to deal with the scheduling data and just keeping that schedule updated in, in real time. But there's a lot of different use cases. Probably, you know, they're all worth a talk in themselves. And just to be cognizant of time, I want to talk a little bit more about these deployment models. And again, this is going to focus primarily on high availability, but there's certainly other aspects of replication that can be applied here. So the first, and the model that most folks are, fam are probably familiar with, is the active standby deployment model, where you have one primary, or a system that can accept read-write changes, and one or more standbys. And standbys are read-only, and the standbys can be used for all sorts of purposes. But typically what happens in these systems is that most of your traffic is going to your primary, or all of your write traffic is going to the primary, and you know, you're, you're either copying those changes to the standbys, or you have other people who are reading those changes from the standbys. Now, what's nice about this model is that conceptually it's very simple, because you have a single source of truth there, that is your primary. And this is, you know, the reason why this is useful is that you always know, you always have a consistent source of changes. And why that matters is that if something happens to your system, if you need to restore from a backup, or there, you, know, you, you really need to know what change there is, or it's taking a long time to replicate changes to one of your standbys, you always know where, the, where your truth is. Now, there's other ways that you can propagate the truth more, well, let's say more quickly or more accurately. Uh, post, you know, there's, there's different replication modes. There's asynchronous replication and synchronous replication. Asynchronous replication in Postgres, or in general, means that as soon as a change comes in, send it out to all the standbys. But you don't actually know if it got committed to those standbys, you just know that you sent it as quickly as possible. And that's more performant, but you don't necessarily know if the change is committed elsewhere, and that can have ramifications both for your you know, high availability and ultimately the, the consistency of your system if you need to perform a failover. So then there's something called synchronous commit, which basically is if I have three standbys, make sure that the change is committed to all three standbys before you consider the transaction committed on the primary, which will guarantee that your, your transactions are committed everywhere, but that can be a lot slower depending how far away your standbys are, how busy your systems are, et cetera. So there's a nice balance in between, and that's called quorum commit. And quorum commit says, make sure I've committed my transactions on n many systems, or n is a number. So let's say I have three instances in my set, one primary, two standbys, and I set n to two, then you're basically saying, make sure that my transaction is committed on at least two systems, and then consider it committed. And the reason why that's a nice balance is that you guarantee that your transaction is committed in at least one other place, and you're not necessarily waiting for all the other systems to commit. So, as I mentioned, there's a lot of advantages to this model. In, in part, it's simple. It's very easy to understand that I make all my changes in one place and they get propagated elsewhere. And as, an, you know, as someone who's a recovering app developer, that's very nice too, because I know that I'm pointing my writes all in one place or like all at one endpoint, and I know that they're there. And it's much easier to build an application that way. And then let's say I need to like reroute my read queries elsewhere. Okay, well, I can understand, you know, if I'm using synchronous commit or quorum commit, I know that from a consistency standpoint, my query, you know, I'm pulling you know, fresh data from at least you know, one standby. But you know, maybe it, that doesn't matter for my application. I can have some stale data on the asynchronous replicas, and, and again, that's okay. But there are some trade-offs to this method, and we can debate these trade-offs. This is certainly a good uh, you know, after, after the fact discussion, but no matter what with this model, in a high availability setup, there is more work. If you have to fail over, you have to do work. Because you have a single source of truth, you need to make sure there's only ever one source of truth. And this is called avoiding the problem with split brain. Now, split brain, shouldn't, so split brain is when you suddenly have two primaries within your high availability set and both are accepting rights because then you don't know which one's the single source of truth. 
and that can create some big headaches. But in a normal high availability uh, failover scenario with active standby, typically what happens is you identify your candidate standby to promote, then you take out the primary. You're like, I'm no longer accepting writes. I'm going to fence it off. I'm going to make sure it's down. I'm not going to allow any traffic to route to it. Then I'm going to route all my write traffic to the, new, to the newly promoted. I'm going to promote the, uh, the standby and route all my traffic there. Because the idea is you need to be as careful as possible and not sending, having, well, one, having multiple writers at any given time, but you also need to make sure you're able to reroute that traffic accordingly. Now, again, there's some wonderful tools out there to help with that. There's wonderful automated systems to help with that, but it's still more work. And by work, there's a time. And if your goal is to reduce downtime, well, you know, there's only so much that you're going to be able to reduce in the system in a way that will you know, help to achieve those targets. And again, like I, we can discuss the, the various trade-offs there all day, but I think we're going to get to the topic that brings most of you here, which is active-active. Now you're going to say, Jonathan, wait, you just told me that you don't want multiple primaries in a system, so why, why, why are you suddenly showing me this thing with multiple primaries? That's a very good question, and that, again, can probably just be a whole discussion in itself, but the reality is, is that this model is out here for relational databases where I do have multiple primaries, and I do have multiple systems accepting writes you know, simultaneously, and they're replicating their changes back and forth to each other. That's a lot, right? Like the first time, I mean, the first time I saw Active Active, I mean, again, I was an app developer, so I'm like, oh, cool, this is a panacea. This solves all my problems right everywhere. Like everything is going to be fine. But we'll talk about that. The idea, you know, the idea of this is that you can write everywhere, that you have databases that are always available, that can always accept reads and writes, and it doesn't matter. And you can even you know, extend it out further, too. You can have standbys off of this model, but typically they're not in a high availability set. And as you can imagine, given I can write everywhere, you know, one of the target use cases is high availability. But another that I've come to discover while going on my, my personal active-active journey is this notion of blue-green deployments. And this extends in many different ways. So blue-green deployment is the idea that I have a production system doing something, and I want to roll out some changes. It could be a major version upgrade, or it could be application changes. I want to test a new version of my application, but it's still something you know, that's a production-like system, so I want the changes to replicate back and forth between you know, production and where I'm trying to roll up my new system. And likewise, I might want the ability to roll back. I might switch my traffic to green, but I don't like something in it. I want to go back to blue, but I don't want to lose my changes. So very useful technique. Um, we're starting to see this more emerge more in Postgres, but I still say in many ways we're in the early days of that. And likewise, there were system migrations, trying to migrate between, let's say, you know, different infrastructures and trying to keep everything writable at the same time. The nice thing about active-active, when it all works, is that you've basically pushed the high availability problem from your database to your networking layer. It's all about rerouting traffic to stay available. But in this very uh, undersimplified list of trade-offs, there's more things you need to consider. You've shifted one problem. Like, the database is no longer your problem in high availability. As long as you have conflict detection and conflict resolution, which we're going to talk quite a bit about, and you're basically saying, hey, guess what, application developers? you got to do work now. Your life is going to be a lot harder because you're going to need to account for these things called conflicts, where multiple systems might write to the same row at the same time and make different changes, which is the source of truth. Because remember, we just said like a few minutes ago, we don't want split brain. But here we go. We've like, introduced a system that we're relying on that can create a split-brain scenario. So what does Postgres need to do to support active-active? It does. Did you know that? Postgres already supports active-active. Well, there's an asterisk to that. As soon as we added support for logical replication, technically we start supporting active-active in a way because your publisher and subscriber both had to be writer instances. And we started adding features to Postgres that it made it possible to do what you might consider a real active-active system, where you could replicate the, if you, replic if you set up a partition table in Postgres, and say had, you know, let's say we have two instances, you know, two partitions in a table. Instance one writes to partition A, instance two writes to partition B, and then bidirectionally replicate those partitions so they're all getting each other's changes. Well, you have an active-active system, and, you know, in the sense of, you know, how you, how you would think of it. Um, I've tried setting that up before. I wrote a blog post about that several years ago. And like, while it works, and you can like, write something that doesn't have conflicts, it's a pain in the butt to manage. 
So technically, you can do it. And if you don't like that, if you want something easier, there's a ton of third-party tools and extensions that provide active-active support for Postgres. But probably something that caught folks' eye in the recent Postgres 16 release was that it kind of added bi-directional replication support. Uh, we're going to see that feature in a few slides, but technically, you can now directly replicate two tables between each other. Now, the problem is that it's missing some of the key pieces to truly support active-active, which this slide lays out. For one thing, uh, right now, Postgres only replicates DML changes, so insert, update, delete changes. And for some of these, uh, you know, for some of these operations, you need to replicate more. Now, DDL replication over logical replication is a loaded topic. And if you're interested in catching up on it, there is a very long thread in the community about it. But there's a lot of scenarios where, particularly in Active Active, you may or may not need to replicate DDL. Actually, a lot of Active Active systems choose not to replicate DDL because it is a very hard problem. But really, the key thing is these two things over here. Conflict detection, conflict resolution, conflict statistics slash conflict logging. Right now, Postgres can detect conflicts. I mean, effectively, it's a, it's a constraint violation that you're, you know, you're writing, well, it's one kind of conflict detection where you write something on one instance that violates a constraint on the other. It's going to fail, but then everything's going to back up in the system because you're not going to be accepting any more writes from that system until you fix the conflict on the other system. But there's a more subtle one, which is, as we described before, you update one row, you update the same exact row on the other system, and they each have slightly different changes, and you replicate them over. Which one do you pick? So we need conflict resolution systems. And frankly, you know, you're not going to be the person going in to like, modify all of those conflicts. You're going to need a way to automatically deal with it. And then you probably want to log what happened in case you do have to be that person to go back in and verify that the conflict was accurate. Like, for example, if you're managing a financial services system, you probably want to make sure if there's a, a conflict on a banking record that it is accurate. The, the last bit is dealing with node synchronization, which, which is probably a whole talk in itself, which is how do I initially set up an active-active system? And while my active instances goes down for a bit, how do I catch up with all the other changes in the system? What, I have, what if I have a maintenance operation? What if, what if I need to do a point in time recovery in one of the systems? Lots of things that you got to worry about in a distributed system. So we are working in the community to address it. And the core driver for this is logical replication. And I forgot to mention at the top because I got uh, a little discombobulated with uh, the laptop switch. But um, Amit Kapila, uh, he's a com uh, Postgres committer at Fujitsu. Uh, him and I originally gave this talk at PGCon earlier this year. So I do want to credit this slide to him, um, which is, you know, I, you know, I know it's a little bit hard to read on this font, but that's a little bit by design, is that there's been many years of work on adding support to logical replication in Postgres, starting from 9.4, when the initial support for replicating changes in a logical format, uh, particularly the decoding framework, was added to Postgres, to Postgres 10, which uh, natively supported uh, subscriptions in Postgres, and on and on and on to, to Postgres 15. And as you see, what's happened is that more and more functionality has been added through the years to help Postgres logically replicate changes in many different ways. I would say the emphasis lately has been on adding more functionality, you know, which we'll really see what happened in 16 there, but flexibility too, because one of the big things about logical replication is that it's very flexible. With physical replication, you're replicating, whoop, what just happened there? Uh, with physical replication, you're replicating everything, every change, byte for byte, doesn't matter, doesn't discriminate. With logical replication, you can choose exactly what you want to replicate, you can choose to replicate everything. You can choose to replicate only a single table. As opposed to Postgres 15, you can even choose to replicate only certain rows that match particular filters or only certain columns. And that's really powerful. Perhaps not for like high availability systems where you are replicating everything, but for systems such as ETL systems, CDC systems, things where you might be pushing data into a real-time data warehouse, and you don't need to worry about pushing everything. You only need that subset of data. So let's explore some recent enhancements in Postgres, in, in Postgres 16. And it was a lot. Um, you know, Postgres 16 was a very big release in itself. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't want to frame it either which way. You know, is it a logical replication heavy release? Was it a performance heavy release? Was it a developer feature heavy release? Um, perhaps a little bit of all of the above, but there's been a lot of focus on logical replication. 
And there's a reason for that. In part, it's the title of this talk, that this is the journey towards supporting active-active replication. But to paraphrase it a different way, um, and credit to my colleague Grant McAllister for this, logical replication is in the critical path for many Postgres users now. Beyond just availability, it's being used in these data warehouses and these downstream, you know, these downstream systems that are processing, processing information in real time. And that's very, it's, that's very cool and very scary from, you know, from a lot of different standpoints. But because of this, you know, we are continuing to make this heavier investment in it. And you know, it starts with all these features that you see here, which we're going to actually dive a little bit into each one. So the first is phrased in a funny way, origin filtering. Because this is actually the bi-directional feature. Now, if, how many people read the Postgres 16 release announcement? That's like the email in the news post that went out. Cool. Did you see anything about bi-directional replication in there? Yeah, so that was a little bit by design. Because while this did add support for bi-directional replication, there's still more work we need to do upstream to be able to say like, hey, yeah, we truly support bi-directional replication the way that you think. Because you can add it today. We're going to see an example in one slide for how to do it. But it will take some work to manage based upon everything else we just said. But it is relatively simple to set up. And it goes back to this, this origin field when you create a subscription. So an origin is an identifier. It basically says, hey, where did this transaction originate from? And prior to Postgres 16, you know, this was you know, by default always set. Now, the problem is that this tracked the origin on every single change. And let's say I tried to replicate two, you know, like I have instance A, instance B, and I want to replicate changes between them. Instance A gets the change. It's like, hey, I made a change. It came from me. Instance A, here you go, instance B. Instance B gets the change. Oh, cool, I just got a change. It came from me, instance B. Sends that back over the wire to instance A. So see, like suddenly we have a loop, and they're just going to be like sending the changes back and forth until you know, everything collapses. Now, if we remove the origin, if we basically just like, effectively like, anonymously send a change, uh, in a way, what happens is that the, the subscriber receives the change, and it's like, OK, there's no origin to this, so I'm just going to apply it, and cool, we're done. Like, I don't need to do any additional work. And that solved like, that very big problem, that loopback problem. And it also allows for starting to create these replication, you know, these bidirectional meshes of instances in Postgres. It's, a little bit, it's actually pretty simple to set up. Um, it's almost a little bit too simple, if you look at it. Um, to use an example, you can try it out today. Uh, I recommend using two different instances for it to see the full effect. And you, can, you get bidirectional replication. Now, again, some things may not work as expected. For example, the first thing I tried to do was I started trying to add sequences to it, non-conflicting sequences, mind you. And I then suddenly I had to do a lot more work. So again, this is where the onus comes to the application developer. Because sure, you're creating this like, wonderful low downtime system, and you're telling the application developer, hey, I just made your job a lot harder, but I made mine a lot easier. So that's the trade-off you're going to have to look at there. Now, the next thing, while this is not directly related to active-active, well, it might be getting there a little bit, because as a Postgres 16, we support logical replication from standby. So here's like a typical setup. You have a primary, you have a standby. You might have a subscriber. So the subscriber is just reading in logical changes, and you know, it's pulling them from the primary. And what happens is that you, know, you probably have your subscriber doing, you know, your users interacting with the subscriber doing whatever they're doing. And you have a primary that's just taking like, the brunt of the work, right? It's taking all the writes, probably some reads. And the standby is probably just there, like, I'm taking some reads, but I'm not doing much. I'm just replaying changes, but you know, I'm having a good time. I don't have to work too hard. But that primary is working really, really hard. And logical replication takes work, because remember, we have to decode all the changes that are going through, and then we have to send them out. And then you know, th there's some additional work that goes on as well. So anything we can do to reduce the load on the primary is generally a good thing, particularly if logical replication is in your critical path. So there's a brilliant idea. Why don't we do this? This is very simple, right? Because now I've shifted my, my standby is less busy. I've shifted logical replication to the standby. So that way, I'm able to replicate those changes. I'm able to take load off the primary, replicate from the standby, and generally it's OK. Because granted, the way a lot of the changes are used on the subscriber, it's OK if they logically replicate maybe a little bit slower than they normally would, because they're real-time systems, but real-time is relative. You know, if it's instantaneous real-time, well, you probably, well, that's a whole other thing. But 
likely you're able to, to have a, a slight delay, save some, save some resources in your primary and have a good day. So notice how simple this was, right? I basically moved the arrow from here to here. Cool, in Postgres 16. How simple was it really? The initial proposal for this was back in 2016. So today's 2023. This took a little bit of time. It was a multi-year effort for a lot of reasons. It was, in part, a very technically hard problem to solve. There was lots of like starts and stops with it, and there was a huge concerted effort over the past, well, between, I'd say, November 2022 and probably like a couple of hours before uh, uh, feature freeze in April to get this in. And I mean, it really, and it was, you know, it, it was a huge community collaboration. And, and I did specifically want to call that out because logical replication is definitely one of those rising tide lifts all ships features that everyone needs it as like everyone collaborates and works on it. It only helps to further enhance this feature, you know, for the benefit of everyone in the community. So it's great to see this, you know, finally make it in. You know, this is one of those examples of if we're going to do it in Postgres, we're going to do it right, but we're going to spend effort on it to make sure it is right. And there's still some more work to do on it. Um, one of the associated efforts, one, one of the things that was driving this is this feature called, I'm going to loosely call it failover slots, but this is to appropriately support failover when you have logical replication in, involved, so that way you're able to get the consistency and correctness guarantees that you're looking for. So this was the precursor work, which took seven years. Next up, and this is definitely going to help with active-active, parallel apply of large transactions. So in an oversimplified world, um, and again, I apologize for the formatting. So remember, we have a sender and a receiver. And we basically need a way to send our transactions and apply them. But sometimes we get a very large transaction going through the system. And what happens is that it's going to take some time to apply the large transaction on, the, on a subscriber. What happens when this occurs is that suddenly transactions start backing up on your primary because it's, you know, it's getting delayed, you know, waiting for all the changes to apply. And this is going to have a negative downstream effect. The worst case is that your, your subscriber is spending so much time trying to apply these changes that the primary gets too backed up, where either it can't ever catch up, or you run into disk exhaustion because you're basically retaining all of the write-ahead logs on the primary until you know that they've been appropriately sent or you know, replayed on the replica. So that's not good. But we can do better, which is we can uh, have a parallel apply of large transactions. So what parallel apply of large transactions is that once you're on the receiver or you're, in, you're into the apply process, you can basically use parallelism to break up the larger transaction and start you know, putting onto the disk you know, and, you know, in mul using multiple workers. And what's nice about that is that, well, there's a lot of nice things, right? It's a performance feature. So if you have a large transaction, suddenly it's not as much of a pain on your system. It also lays the groundwork for future work where maybe we can start applying all transactions in parallel. Because suddenly what can happen is that we can make logical replication faster than physical replication if we're able to truly parallelize that process. Now, before you start thinking like, oh my god, this is coming immediately, again, note, that is a hard problem. Doing anything in parallel once you are applying or committing transactions must be very carefully done because otherwise you may break your correctness guarantees. But wait, there's more. There were security enhancements in this release. Yep. So here's a, you know, a little uh, nuance. It was that this might seem a little innocuous that before Postgres 16, all transactions, when you were applying the transactions on the subscriber, they were applied as the subscription owner. Now, the subscription owner was the Postgres super user. It could only be the Postgres super user. The Postgres super user has a lot of power. Now, that might seem okay. You know, you might trust your super user. You might have a single tenant system. But what could happen is that you might have a user come in on a table that was being a, a subscriber that's having logical changes replicated to it. It might have a trigger on it. And the trigger might say, like, hey, alter, alter user me super user. Now, by default, that code doesn't execute, but you can actually set it to execute fairly easily, and then suddenly you have someone who's an unprivileged user gaining super user privileges because of this model. Now, this has been fixed. Um, now the transactions run as with the scope of the table owner, who is hopefully not a super user. Now, there's another thing I said as well, which is that the subscription owner could only be a super user. 
But there's another feature added to this, which allows non-super users to create subscriptions and be a subscription owner. And there's a, you know, a special role that you grant to the user called PG Create Subscription. Now, again, you know, caution to the wind. Even though an unprivileged user can now have this permission, this is still an elevated permission. Logical, you know, logical replication is very powerful. You're basically giving the power to apply transactions from a remote system. So exercise caution with using this. I think there's more, there's more to this uh, security model as well, but I, you know, I do want to call out these changes because they do, uh, you know, they do make it safer to use logical replication in Postgres. And again, another thing to consider as we move towards supporting active-active workloads. Now, another nice thing is uh, being able to accelerate uh, initializing a subscriber. And there's a feature that uh, basically allows you to copy over the changes in the Postgres binary format which is a little bit faster than the text format. So Postgres is like two formats. There's text and binary. Binary is ultimately what it's going to look like on disk. Text is a logical representation of it. Now, if you're sending everything over in binary, well, you're not doing a conversion from like text to binary to text, or excuse me, or binary to text to binary. You're basically just doing binary to binary. So that reduces the overhead, and there's certainly a speed up to that. But remember what we said up top about Postgres, you know, physical replication where you're copying things byte for byte? It kind of, you know, there's kind of a limited scope in which you can use this. It's effectively Postgres instances that are the same major version, that have the same underlying file system, same operating system, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if, you're, if your environment supports that, cool. This, this is going to help speed things up for you on, on initialization, particularly if you have very large tables you have to copy over. Now, last but not least, in Postgres 16 land, um, they, you now have the ability to use indexes for replica identity full. Now, first off, public service announcement or public service advisory. If you're using logical replication, please put a primary key on the table. Please, please, please. Like, it's just going to make your life a lot easier, especially when you're using active-active. If you have situations where you can't, or you can't declare a replica identity, you're going to use replica identity full, well, there's, there's now a feature for you. Because previously, so, th so what's going to happen when you apply a transaction is that you have to look up, you effectively have to do a lookup in a table to see if that row already exists. And if you, have, if you have no replica identity, if you have no primary key, you're using replica identity full, which means you're doing a sequential scan. A sequential scan is scanning every single row in the table. If you have a very large table, this is going to take a very long time. But now, um, Postgres is now smart enough to say, like, oh, I can use a B tree associated with that table to do that lookup and speed it up and avoid that sequential scan. So it makes using replica identity full slightly less painful. But please, at all costs, do not rely on this. Please have primary keys defined so as much in as much as you can. And if you can't, um, well, you have a way out. Now, before moving on to some of uh, the, the forward-looking stuff, um, I want to call out this slide, which my, my two-and-a-half-year-old called the butterfly when she first saw this. But just to showcase like, the collaborative effort like through you know, a bunch of different companies in the post, in Postgres world or in the Postgres space that worked on all these features. And I tried to like, correlate them, like, hey, who's, you know, who authored which feature? But like, really, like, all these companies like, came together and helped in different areas because it's not just about writing the feature. Especially a lot of the logical replication work, it's reviewing it, it's testing it. And why that's so important is that it is in the critical workflow for many Postgres users now. And because of that, we want to make sure that it's, you know, it's safe to use. You know, this is why something like logical replication from standbys took a long time, because there were subtle things in there that if, if we got them wrong, it could have a serious impact on, user, on, on Postgres users using it. So it's great to see the effort. Like, and even in the cases where a company, like, that might not be like the patch they were working on, they still came in. Like, they, they helped to review it. They helped to test it. They gave feedback. And I think what we came away with in Postgres 16 was like a really solid set of features and really you know, laying the groundwork for what's to come in the roadmap. Segways, right? See? Let's talk a little bit about what's coming up. So I think there's two sets of things to think about here. There's features in, that we just need to add to logical replication in Postgres just to harden it, make it better, catch it up to some of the other commercial systems out there. And there's the features that we need to specifically add natively to Postgres to support logical replication. And again, you might find these you know, elsewhere in Postgres in various you know, extensions, third-party tools, et cetera, but we do need to continue driving this upstream. 
So this is a, so in this word vomit slide, um, this is kind of thinking like what's coming in Postgres 17 or what we're trying to do in Postgres 17 and beyond. Because like, first of all, like detailed replication, I'm probably gonna put in like that beyond category because there's still a lot of open questions there. So DDL, that's anything that's around a structural change, you know, create table, alter table, et cetera. It's, uh, it's a big effort. And it's very important, maybe less in the active-active case, but more in the unidirectional logical replication case where I'm just pushing changes, you know, downstream. Particularly like blue-green deployments or anything where I'm, you know, I'm, keeping, I'm keeping another instance you know, as similar to my other instances as possible, like this is very important. Similar like replication of sequences, which there's been a lot of activity on that lately. This is more trying to keep another system in sync that might ultimately be in my high availability set or used, you know, for a later purpose. Um, all these, you know, the, I guess the other one, synchronization of replication slots, that's the failover slots. Again, targeting high availability, but all things that are just going to harden and Postgres for more logical replication use cases. And other things to like help with uh, you know, general performance and you know, making it simpler to use uh, logical replication. Many of these do help drive active-active, but you know, there are some specifically you know, for active-active, and again, I, again, I apologize for the formatting due to the last minute change, but the first thing and probably the most important thing we need to look at in Postgres is conflict management. So remember, so conflict is when multiple change, you know, when you know, one or more instances, well, two or more instances change the same row simultaneously, you need a way to resolve it. Postgres has the building blocks for that, and I know this because I've seen multiple extensions you know, implement based upon those building blocks, but ultimately, if we want to support this natively in Postgres, we need, we need to add you know, the systems upstream. We need to be able to detect the conflicts. We need to have some kind of resolution in it. Um, where I would personally propose would be last commit wins. That seems to be where the industry is gravitated towards. Um, if you look at some of the mature, uh, the mature active active products out there, they offer like all sorts of ways to customize your conflict resolution. But from talking to those users of it more and more, basically they're saying like, yeah, we're ripping all that out and just going to last commit wins and like pushing, pushing the work back down to the app developer, which again, from the database perspective, it's like, yeah, make the app developer work. Um, but the reason why is like last commit wins is very easy to understand. If I have two transactions and they both modify the same record at the same time or around the same time, take the one with the, the latest timestamp. But that basically means, so again, that's very easy to understand. And it's very easy to resolve those, those kinds of issues. But you push the problem somewhere else, you've pushed the problem to your clock management system because you need to make sure your clock management system across your distributed systems are aligned. So it's no, look, it, it's, there's, no, there's no free lunch here, but you know, these, these are all things that we need to consider for this. Um, and monitoring is an important thing too. You can't have any kind of automated conflict resolution without detecting and monitoring the conflicts. You know, that's key. And again, many of these systems already do this, but we would need something in Postgres to deal with that. Beyond that, we need to focus on the node, the node synchronization problem. It's actually something we're probably doing, I, I wanna be fair, I don't wanna say it's in its, early, like in its early stages, but we need to focus on it more, both from a management and a performance perspective from Postgres, where how do I bring a, a node up with logical replication in a way that's efficient? Because if I'm adding a three terabyte database to an active-active set, you know, I don't want to wait a week for it to get initialized. I need to get that initialized fairly quickly. And with our physical tools, we have, we have a lot of ways of doing that today, but we need to get better at that with our logical tooling. And there's a, there's a whole other, other topics there, you know, talking about you know, an active instance healing type uh, mechanism. Finally, uh, something on, uh, that's been proposed upstream, uh, sequence access methods. So an access method is a way to add functionality into Postgres, like it's an API for extension developers to build. Now, sequence replication for active-active is a loaded topic, because that's a very easy way to end up in conflicts, but what if you could define your own sequence, like a Snowflake ID, where Snowflake IDs are meant to be distributed sequences that can kind of work independently and not conflict, in theory. Well, the way to be able to implement that is something called a sequence access method, which there is a patch upstream, so please test and review, because getting that into Postgres would certainly help with that problem. Finally, performance. We need to improve performance for logical replication. Now, what does that mean? Um, it means it's something that, uh, th th 
the one thing we're seeing is when we push these systems at scale, they, they don't perform as well as their counterparts. I don't have like exact numbers I can share at this moment, but it's well known. Like we just need to continue improving the, per the performance. I mean, you say that about anything, but definitely in logical replication. So with that, um, I do want to leave a few minutes for questions. I know uh, time got cut a little bit short, but um, thank you. I hope this is informative. I hope you understand sort of the journey we need to get on to make Postgres you know, viable for active active deployments. Thank you. Can you explain a bit more about uh, the parallelization of uh, the applied process for uh, large transactions? How do they uh, understand that it, it's safe to parallelize the transaction? Yeah, so I'll, I'll do the best I can on this one. So there's a threshold that's set for it. I believe it's 75 kilobytes. I can't remember if there's a parameter for it. Um, but basically, as soon as it exceeds that threshold, then it knows it can parallelize it. And then there's the lock to, to determine how many workers it can use. Yes, uh, during uh, some years ago, we heard you know talks about BDR. Uh, now it seems that this project is no longer active, right? P <laughs> All right, PGH took, took over. Uh, mm -hmm. th this is good news, but uh, the consensus was uh, about us, we who, who manage systems, <laughs> that. Um, if uh, the application uh, doesn't have, uh, you know, uh, a lot of uh, deadlocks, it will be most probably okay uh, if we applied, you know, uh, multi-master uh, architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, how, is, how is the situation? I, I heard in a lot of more than one, more than once you referred to to the application and um, uh, some extra burden that will. Uh, fall on the shoulders of the developers, if, if, if I'm right. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what's the situation with um, how you people imagine the, the, the future of uh, multi-master? OK, so, uh, so uh, let, me, let me try to rephrase the question. So, so is the question around how we can develop an active-active type architecture to make it simpler for application developers to work with it? Yeah. Okay. What should we change? Okay. So, one. So some of these things are, you know. So the, probably the, one of the biggest things that you see in a lot of applications from the common, you know, I'll speak as a web developer, like from the common web frameworks, is that you get a surrogate key or an ID, and that ID is a monotonically increasing sequence, aka an integer sequence. And typically, when you have an integer sequence, and you have multiple integer sequences going, and you start from the same key, you're going to have conflicts. So the first thing you have to do when deploying it in a distributed si system is to have non-conflicting sequences. Now, this is where something like the sequence access methods that I, I described on this slide help, because it allows a way to de define sequences where the app developer doesn't have to worry about how the sequence increments. They can just like, hey, choose this non-conflicting sequence, and then done. Really, then the burden on the app developer is to make sure they select that sequence. Now, there's other things, you know, the, the other big thing that an app developer needs to be aware of are, are conflicts. Like, what happens if there's a conflict, it's resolved, and, you know, how do I make sure that resolution on one of the conflicting systems is flushed to the application such that it's not working with stale data and potentially, you know, updating, you know, making then another update that contains the stale information. And that's a little bit harder. I mean, there's all the different ways of doing that. There's, you know, various versioning techniques that help with that or, you know, timestamps where you can keep track of when something was updated. But there might be, you know, th there's certainly like another, another level of tooling that we can get to to, to simplify that. I think that's a, a good ongoing discussion. So I hear, uh, I hear the music being played. You know, I'm happy, you know, I'll be around all week, so happy to discuss this more. Um, thank you for attending.